Better Late Than Never next installment of We've Been Had, the uh, the show where we discuss or even debate albums for your listening pleasure. I am Keith Billy. And I'm Chad Cook. And uh, the deal here is that we take turns picking an album, and then we, we both dig into it. Um, this time around, way back in February, <laughs> I, uh, I suggested that we needed to put Gen X on trial with the singles soundtrack. Yeah, uh, and I should mention that this is the first one of these we were doing in person for ever, it seems like. It's insane. It's, um, I mean, since 2019? No, I think we did one in very early 2020. Like hmm. right before COVID, it's kind of kind of irresponsible. It's really well, you know, we we didn't know it was, it was a different era. Just as a brief aside, did you uh, did you ever read the uh, Douglas Coupland book Gen X? You know, I did, and I wanted it to be profound, but I I don't I don't think I really got anything out of it. Yeah, I I was not a fan. Um, I did like his book Microsurfs. I don't know the, if you ever read that. That's the one of his that I'll go to bat for. I totally agree. Like I've read, I went through a stretch where like I really wanted to like him and read like a bunch of them, and that was the only one that. I, but I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, it's kind of it's interesting because that's uh, not quite Gen X and not quite Millennials, but yeah. you know, whoever the whoever the you know kind of first wave programmers were. And the weird thing is like that. That game Minecraft, I think, is is the game they're building in that book. Like, you're, this is Legos on your computer. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, <laughs> um, literature literature portion of the show over. Yeah, the, uh, now that the period bell rings and it's on to music appreciation. Um, so yeah, tombstone information for the uh, the singles soundtrack. Released nineteen June of 1992 on Epic Soundtracks with an X. Um, no real point listing the producer because it's a soundtrack. It's a bunch of different songs produced by a whole slew of people. Um, but if the album has a guiding spirit, it's Cameron Crowe, and we'll talk about him. Terrifying. <laughs> um, I always like to give a, an album description at the top, and this one is pretty easy. This is a this is your basic grunge sampler with some outliers. Um, I think this is like you know how like they used to have in France they would have like the steel rod that was this is a meter and there'd be like the the weight that like this is a gram. I feel like this album is like this is mainstream grunge. Yeah, it's kind of this or no alternative. Yeah. Kind of um, the two uh, the two competing forces. The, the other 90s ubiquitous thing. Uh, the one thing I wanted to throw in before we get to that exact thing is that, like, I don't think this album, like, I know it was sold as an album and we all listened to it as an album, but it doesn't, like, work at all as a unified listening experience. You know, it just, I mean, like, it says singles on the front and it, it lives up to that. Yeah, and it, it, it does feel like... You know, we do we do a couple songs, and then we do a ballad, and then we do a rock rock song, and it it does feel a little bit squished together. Oh yeah, I mean, like, let's put let's put a couple of Paul Westerberg jams next to Alice in Chains because that's yeah. yeah I don't I, I'll speak more about that <laughs> at, when we get to it. Oh, uh, but I you know so like to try to just set the context for this, I feel like this is a thing that. Just lands, you know, I don't know. The people who listen to the show, I know that most of them are our age. Um, I know we have some listeners that are younger. And I feel like this is going to land completely differently. You know, like, people our age like, oh, yeah, the fucking single soundtrack. I remember that thing. Um, if you're not our age, I don't know if you can relate to just how ubiquitous this damn thing was. Yeah, and I, mean, I think it was part of it was that people really liked the movie. Um, you know, I, you know, I was never a huge fan of the movie, I guess, but um, I, I would have been a booster back in the day, and that that changed. But I, uh, it, it was, I mean, it was cool that it was one of the you know, kind of first movies that 
that I had seen as a as kind of a fledgling adult that that actually talked about music in terms yeah. of like you know, going to see Alice in Chains and the guys from Pearl Jam are in the fake band Citizen Dick. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, I mean, it, it has its moments. It's just kind of a, I don't know. It's just not, at least in my vision, that's not what adult life is really like. Totally. Well, at least not for me. Someone, uh, you know, I don't remember where I saw this. Somewhere when I was like reading up on people's takes in this album and the movie. Someone pointed out that the movie is Friends, like, you yeah. know, before Friends was on the air. But it's like this, it's like young, attractive twenty-somethings who all, almost all, live next to each other and all go and hang out at a coffee shop. And um, I don't, I guess that's just that's the spirit of the nineties. Um, but I mean, just I don't know, the dominance of this thing in the in the early nineties is nuts. I. I remember in the summer of 1992, this guy in my high school was kind of a butthead, was like in my face, like, ha, oh, you don't have the single soundtrack yet? You are lame. And like, I, it just, like, it really felt like it was like de rigueur, like you had to own this. Yeah, I mean, like, what other, what other soundtracks could you use as a diss? Like... Nobody's nobody's like, oh, you don't have the topol version of Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Fuck you. Well, remember the Crow soundtrack? Oh a yes, bit of that. yes. I I blocked that movie out of my memory. Yeah. I feel like that was one of those movies that I wanted to like really badly. Like yeah. I, I was sold on it, and then I watched it, and I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. Nah. Like, just just not my thing. Um, but I do, uh, and I, I feel like I'm gonna shit on a lot of stuff that's on this album. But <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's interesting, I think, just is is the first song, uh, is an Alice in Chains song, which is is just always fascinating to me that they get lumped in with the like Seattle song. I mean, like they're from Seattle, no, and, I, I, and, and that that's as far as it geographically. Goes. But they're <laughs> just they're not the like I don't know they're not the like. Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Melvins kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, so, I mean, I think part of that is that, like, this whole idea, I don't know, like, sure, cities have sounds and, you know, groups influence each other, but, like, that gets so overhyped. I mean, like, you know, Alice in Chains, I, I don't know, just not everyone... When it gets down to it, what they have distorted guitars, just like other bands. Wow, that's that's a unified sound. I just it, to me, it sounds like a like a slower version of like Iron Maiden or Dio or something. Yeah, like that. that's like a. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that's it. Always felt to me like Alice in Chains was kind of could have been branded as a metal band, like if they're you know. If their label had just decided to play them a little differently. And just as a side note, I defy you to listen to the Dio song Holy Diver without snickering. <laughs> it's impossible. Like, it's just, it it takes itself so seriously, and it, it's like, Holy Diver! <laughs> Did you not see the sign on the on, in the yard on the way in that says, In this house we respect Dio? <laughs> I did not. I, Damn it. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I um, I mean, I guess to to get into Alice in Chains a little bit more, like I I don't I don't like them. You know, like like I'm not I don't want to shit on them if if people do like them, but they were just they were never for me. So like it was it was always weird like that this album starts off with this kind of this hostile intro and um, you know I don't want to spoil anything here, but to me, this album is functionally a Paul Westerberg single with a lot of B-sides. Um, and so, like, like it's weird that it kicks off with the song that clashes the hardest with the Westerberg songs. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think I have the, as much negativity for Alice in Chains as you do, but 
And I think that actually when I don't know if you remember that for a while MTV was doing like an unplugged series. Mm -hmm. And I actually think the Alice in Chains unplugged is one of the better I don't think I ever better saw ones it. in the series. It's it's really good. It's uh you know, I think I think Alice in Chains kind of struggles sometimes with what it wants to be. I think I might like them better if I went back to it now. You know, like I just I they were outside of whatever my notion of purity was then. Um, you know, like I think I appreciate weird guitar a lot more than I used to now. And you know, I I do like that like a lot of the guitar part for the song is just like just. He's clearly just like letting his amp feed back and like doing it in a controlled way, and that that's pretty cool, like I guess. But but it's still I don't know. I well I was talking to. I think we've talked about this on the show, like the weird bit in um, Lynch's Lost Highway, where you know people are at this like abstract jazz club and like Bill Pullman's playing like just out there abstract jazz and people are dancing to it and like the scene in the movie where this Alice in Chains song appears is kind of the same thing where it's like an Alice in Chains show and you know people are trying to pick each other up in like the the least you know yeah, impossible right <laughs> yeah. it's like it would be like going to a dinosaur junior show and trying to have a conversation with someone yeah. like it's just it's impossible yeah can't be done. I, I believe Bill Pullman was also in the movie Singles, so... He was uh, as, like, an incredibly creepy... Yeah, plastic surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. With so no boundaries. You've, you know, you've sort of hit on, a, a, like, some kind of weird Pullman synthesis. The, the unified... Okay, so one thing I do appreciate about the Bill Pullman scene in the movie is that, um, like, this was, like, one of the very first, like, noticing things in set design in movies is that you know he's the doctor who does breast augmentations and his office has a bunch of these like lamps on the walls that just look like breasts and like they've got like i don't know they've got like little like pink like nipple washers in the middle and i mean you know, stick to what you're good at. Yeah, you know. You if you're it. running a country western bar, you know, <laughs> you don't put a bunch of art deco shit up. That's right. Unless you're running a uh, Western Swing Bar, then you do that. Um, I don't, do you want to step back a second and just talk about the phenomenon of Cameron Crowe in the movie? Um, you know, because like this whole thing, like it exists. Excuse me. This whole thing is what it is, just because Cameron Crowe was like, "I like the music of Seattle, and I'm going to." The yeah, but Kit Crow is an interesting person in terms of like force of will. Yeah. Uh, you know, like getting a job with Rolling Stone when he was a teenager and, and kind of. Uh, I just. It, it, and I don't know if this is probably not fair, but it's a little frustrating to me that like my entire generation has to be interpreted through, you know, Cameron Crow and John Hughes movies. Yeah. Like, I just, that that's just, like, kind of a bridge too far for me, yeah. personally. It's not, I, you know, like, it's this weird thing where, like, it's a very cool thing to have started out as this, like, precocious music journalist. And, like, he had a, a run of making, you know, some good, some kind of shitty movies. But, like, I don't know, like, most of those movies don't hold up that well, and then they just kind of got worse and worse um you know i mean this is a movie like i when it came out i would have been like the soundtrack is good and the movie is good and you know like i i mean the, it's not a good the, movie. the first the first one is maybe a defensible position um i think and in, in, in the time era maybe the movie was a defensible position it just doesn't i don't know that it really holds up now if you were to rewatch, and I did not rewatch it for this, yeah, I rewatched it a while ago, but because I, you know, like the last time I saw it, I thought it was terrible. And I... Yeah, but so you know, so the way I understand it, part of the reason, so if I understand the sequence of events right, Crow had written a screenplay, um, and it was going to be set in Seattle, 
And then the dude from, as that was going on, the dude from Mother Love Bone died. Yeah. And the, you know, Seattle music community kind of rallied around him and everyone was like, ah, Seattle, we gotta, we gotta fly the flag. And like swept up in that, I believe Crow was like, oh, okay then, this, you know, soundtrack to my movie is going to be like a love letter to Seattle. And like, and that's not a terrible mission. But then he's got this other weird thing where the replacements break up at the same time. And, you know, he's got connections. So he's like, I will do a love letter to Seattle, but I will also give Paul Westerberg, you know, the, the venue to, like, move on from the replacements. Um, and that just makes the whole thing weird because, it, you know, you've got, like, like, the Westerberg songs were are by far the most prominent in the movie. And, like outtakes from them keep kind of playing through the movie but then it sits next to all this other stuff that doesn't match at all and i don't know it's it's weird it, yeah. it gets weirder as i get older i mean I, I do think that the the death of andrew wood was kind of a touchstone for all of the seattle artists yeah like it, it does seem to be a a point that really which i mean is totally understandable i mean when you're in your 20s and one of your good friends dies of an overdose it's probably it's pretty significant it just it really it shaped a lot of the you know it's kind of you you wouldn't you don't have pearl jam if that happened it doesn't happen yeah um, you don't have uh temple of the dog you know it's just a it, it was a really and it, i mean it is sad to just kind of look back and see how many people on this album have passed away yeah um you know from lane staley to chris cornell to Andrew Wood, um, Mike Starr, I think, was the original drummer for Alice in Chains, has, has also passed away. I mean, it just is a. It's really, really sad. Yeah. But I will say that uh, the second song, Breath, there are a lot of good Pearl Jam songs. This is not one of them. That's, you know, it's. So my understanding is that the two Pearl Jam songs that are on here were like among the first they recorded. And that they were, you know, that they were recording ten as this movie was being shot. So it's all like, you know, the stuff you have here is like the earliest Pearl Jam, and like it's nuts that like, State of Love and Trust, like it's, it's kind it's, of a consensus, like it's a yeah, great that, song. that's a, yeah. good, it's a good breath. Breath is not. It's like. I just I don't know how that made it onto the album. I mean, mm -hmm. it it just is. It it you know what it reminds me of is, at one point during the Uncle Tupelo. Albums, you said that said something along the lines of Jay Farrar is like listening to uh, listening to a dude with an acoustic reading out of Mother Jones. Yeah, <laughs> and I feel like this is like Eddie Vedder mumble whining over an alternative back backing band. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> earlier today, like I was talking to Rebecca about you know this album, and um, I you know I was like. I don't know, somehow we got talking about the Pearl Jam song, and I'm like, no, there are two Pearl Jam songs. And she's like, what does the other one sound like? Um, and so I was trying to, like, sing Breath, but I don't know the words, so I was just, like, Swedish chefing it. Yeah, well, and, I think he is, too. Yeah, exactly. Honestly. Like, it doesn't, there's no difference. <laughs> uh, I, you know, another thing, like, so I, listening to Breath today, like, I, it did help me realize, like, one of the, key elements of Pearl Jam that I always knew was there but had never twigged to. Like, Jeff Ament does have this really distinctive bass sound. I don't know if he's playing a fretless or what, but he, like, like all Pearl Jam bass has the same, like, burr, 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 like, slidey quality to it that, like, I, you know, I guess, like, it's tough out there for a bass player to... Yeah, I mean, unless you're Jaco Pistorius or Les Claypool or someone, it's, yeah. it's hard to... But, so just for the non-musician, uh, what does a fretless bass give you? The ability to slide around, I guess. You know, so like, frets, frets are nice because then as long as you put your finger anywhere between the two frets, you're going to sound the same note. If it's fretless, it's just wherever your finger is, that's the note, and... So you have to be really precise in where you put your finger if you want to get the right note. But then you can also do a lot more like, you know, just 
slide up and down and get all the space in between the notes. It's like the trombone, but for bass. Yeah, the same. Interesting. Okay, got it. Okay, everything's good. Um, yeah, I don't know. Pearl Jam. Yeah, so I just don't. I don't, I don't get why that song was included. Uh, I think it's all they had. I think. Oh. I think they literally like they hadn't recorded anything else yet. So how? Do, so I guess then how does State of Love and Trust not end up on ten? I think because it was. Tied up in rights. Oh, for this. Yeah. Because huh. I mean, that, that that's, it's definitely a it's definitely a great song. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just weird because you go from, you know, like slow metal song, to, I don't even know what you call breath, to like a Chris Cornell ballad, which is pretty good. Like, that's one that I've really kind of changed my feelings about um you know that was always a skip for me when i was a kid and now i hear it and i'm like yeah you know this is a good use of like the mellow side of chris cornell yeah he does like kind of a cool thing with his voice and he does it actually on the Soundgarden song later too where he kind of where he, he hits the line i'm lost behind and he yeah. kind of like modulates his voice yeah when he says behind so it's kind of yeah it has this cool kind of Effect. I mean, it is a little difficult for me to listen to a Chris Cornell ballad, just knowing, you know, knowing what we know now about Chris Cornell and sort of the pain he was in. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a little, it's a little hard. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I just never was able to jump on the Soundgarden bandwagon. I loved Super Unknown when it, when it came out. Um, and then like I could never really take it further than that. But like that album. <laughs> you did Spoon Man? I loved, I liked Spoon Man. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like that was there was like this brief window where like I opened the door and looked into the world of being like a funky time signatures guy and you know like right then I was like ooh Spoon Man it's in seven four or whatever t- g- g- gimme um, no like I don't know that that's a good album the first album on Super Un- or first song on Super Unknown. Is like has been one of my go-to running jams for ten years or so. Yeah, I, I, so I bought Super Unknown, you know, because I grew up in the '90s. Yeah. And I think MTV just played Black Hole Sun into the ground. They, they did beat the shit out of that song. I don't know. I just it never connected with me the same way that the other that you know Nirvana, Bleach, or Nevermind, or Incesticide did or. Pearl Jam versus, or so even Siamese Dream, like those, I don't know. Those just all resonated with me more than. I I I, I actually it, it, at the time I liked Super Unknown more than most of those albums, except maybe for Versus. You know, just like I, I, what I think it was was I had like a terrible job that that was the summer that I was a night shift janitor at a nuclear power plant and like. Super Unknown was just, like, the right music to hear when yeah. you were going to clean toilets. Um, just, I, yeah, I mean, I and I don't hate it. I just don't think I like it as much as... I mean, it's not that big a problem now, but, yeah. you know, in the 90s... You find yourself shunned by yeah, it. Yeah, in the, in the you know, mid-90s, it was like... You don't like, you don't, you don't like Soundgarden? What are you... <laughs> Fucking poser. Yeah. <laughs> Turn in your flannel. So the funny thing is to flip this around, the one Soundgarden tune on this album I actually don't like much at all. Like I just think it's like replacement level Soundgarden. I actually thought that sounded even more metal than the <laughs> than the uh, Alice in Chains song. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. That's uh, uh, you're not wrong. I mean, I I was surprised at like the you know kind of. Like, if you had told me that was a, I don't know, trickster song or something, I would, I, would have, I would have bought that. So, like, not just metal, but, like, that specific kind of, like, 90s, like, just ass metal. Exactly. Exactly. I know what you mean. Um, so, I, my notes are, like, not in running order. Oh, and I'm, But uh, I, I feel like we have to have... 
It'd have to have passed by one of the Westerberg songs. Uh, first one is after the Chris Cornell ballad is uh, Dick's Dyslexic Heart. So let's... Yeah, are you in the mood to talk, yeah. Westerberg? Yeah, yeah. What, what I mean, you... I... I think it's a weird transition from kind of a downer ballad Absolutely to a, it is. To a super poppy, like, Paul Westerberg song. Yeah. Um, it and, makes no sense when you listen. And, I mean, I guess what... So... And, and I, I wrote this in here that I'm a little embarrassed that this is, this is like, my first introduction <laughs> to Paul Westerberg. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I grew up in the Minneapolis suburbs, and all we had was classic rock. <laughs> But, I mean, a typical Westerberg, like, his voice and writing is really good, but the production on this just drives me nuts. It ain't great. Like, but, you know, it, it's the same, it's kind of the same bad production as All Shook Down. And yeah. Then, and then as 14 songs. Right. Yeah. And I, I guess I like my Westerberg either replacements era or, you know, like, what he gets to later when he records, like, stereo mono. Yeah. And it's just, like, super stripped down. Yeah. Like, that's... You know, like, I think that's where Westerberg shines. This is just... I mean, it's a really catchy song, but it's, you know, it's uh, it's just... It's just a... It's a real... It's like a pop song. Like It is? Excuse me. Well, that was... That Bob Moore um, replacements book, The Trouble Boys, like... One of the weirdest things from that that just blew my mind was reading about, like, I had been, in, the stuff I had projected onto Westerberg's solo career at that point was, like, completely backwards, where I thought that he was intentionally writing, like, difficult, quirky stuff just to be like, fuck you, market, I'm, I'm, I'm Paul Westerberg, I'm writing my own shit. You know, I'm saying things my weird way. And, like, to read that, like, no, this was him trying to, like, cross over and then being disappointed when it wouldn't and then trying, you know, like, I, I, it's just, it's weird to me because, like, I really like Dyslexic Heart. Um, and I, I totally see where you're coming from saying that it sounds like a pop song, but it, it sounds like a pop song from, like, 1970. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound like something that was popular in 1992, or conceivably could have been popular. In and it's got like it's got really good lyrics. I just, I don't know for some. I just that's not my favorite Westerberg. Like, yeah. like I thought when I got stereo mono, I'm like, this is amazing. This is like, you know, this is like a guy recording an album. A great album in his bathroom. Yeah, that is a great fucking album. Yeah, album. and I just, uh, I was, but I think, I mean, even if you look at the, if you look at like Husker Du, when they recorded Candy Apple Gray, there's a, there's an element of the production where it, they were clearly trying to reach a broader audience. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it doesn't have the same edge. No, that, it sounds like ass. Like it's just, it's got, you know, it's got this layer of gloss on it that totally takes away the, the edge that I mean I just wonder if that was the like that was the production aesthetic maybe absolutely that's you know and I I don't think with both Husker Du and the replacements and then Westerberg I don't think it's an accident that when they sign to majors and start working with pro producers you know like high level pro producers like that's when the production gets out of hand and takes things over I don't know. I like, yeah. I hate the production. I hate the way Dyslexic Heart and Waiting for Somebody are put it together. But I can't not love these songs. Like, you know, I, for me, this was basically my way in for Westerberg too. Like, I knew of the replacements, but I hated them because I like I, had, I was like in like REM super fan mode and was like, they said mean things about the replacements, bit, but. I ended up seeing Westerberg touring, like he was basically touring these songs and then a bunch of stuff that became 14 songs, playing in a bowling alley in Omaha. Was it the Ranch Bowl? It was the Ranch Bowl. And it was, you know, it was just such a great show that like, I, you know, I went in being like, well, I guess I'll see this guy since everyone says he's great. And, you know, came out and was like, oh my God. The, uh, my college roommate went to something like, Five or six helmet shows oh, at Jesus. the Ridge Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been insanely loud. 
I, I like. I love that Omaha's best music venue was a bully. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's that's, that's awesome. Our best it's, music venue is a bus station. That's so. right. It's uh, yeah, and, and so I mean, I, I just feel like, yeah, I feel like the if if they would have instead of releasing the if they would have released just if they would have released these two songs produced like you know I don't know uh, an early replacements album I think it would have actually crossed over more effectively than yeah. than trying to use the make them more you know kind of pop friendly yeah I don't know if this is true someone was telling me today that um excuse me that Crow had asked Westerberg to write like an entire album's worth of stuff that would be you know scattered throughout I, I don't know if this was like in conflict with the idea of we'll make it the Seattle sampler or but supposedly Westerberg was supposed to turn in a shitload more material and everything got rejected except these two songs um, but then he like you know walked away with this huge kill fee for not having his stuff used and and if that's true that that seems very on brand for... yeah uh, can we talk about the battle of evermore yeah let's talk about the battle of evermore <laughs> so let me just let me just lay the stage for you you got two people who were in heart yeah. right the people that sang barracuda yeah which is basically a led zeppelin song and you pick you're gonna do a you're gonna do a Led Zeppelin cover, right? You don't pick Black Dog or Cashmere. <laughs> you know, you don't pick something that rocks. You pick the most acoustic finger picky song in their catalog. The, the one that even Zeppelin fans skip. <laughs> I was so conflicted by by exactly that when I was a kid, because it was just like, you know, like uh, like, like Led Zeppelin seemed like the basis of everything, and so like, fucking it, yo, great, yeah. There's some Zeppelin representation on this album, as there should be, but, but is there? Like, <laughs> why this? Is this a monkey's paw wish? <laughs> I just can't. I can't think. I'm trying to like. Was it was a song in the movie, and they couldn't get the rights to the Led Zeppelin version? And they thought it would be cheaper to have no, these people record it. I don't think it. so. I, well, so you you know that Cameron Crowe was married to Nancy Wilson, right? I didn't know that. That yes. makes sense. Okay. Yes, that that unlocks it. Even worse then, because <laughs> clearly he has access to the full heart catalog. Yeah, like, Fuck, just put Barracuda on her. <laughs> right. <sighs> But the, I mean, yeah, you're right. Like, it would have been, everyone would have come out happy. I, I, I mean, I guess it, it must come down to just Nancy Wilson and Ann Wilson must just really like playing this song. Like, uh, you know, like, you have to assume they would have had their pick. Like, anything they chose to p perform, uh, if Crow, I, I don't know. But I mean, was, they chose this. So. Yeah, I mean, I. I mean, one can only assume that their next move is a song, an album song for song cover of Coda. That's the only thing that makes sense. Like, I do think Coda has. So I think Wearing and Tearing is like up there with the best Zeppelin songs. So like, that album is just a skip fest for me. Yeah, it's, like, it's nope, it's, <laughs> nope. It's like two, maybe three killer, and then all filler. Um, so one thing with 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 Zeppelin though, so like I did like sincerely at the time think like Led Zeppelin is you know the underpinning of all music and you know it is only fitting that this soundtrack have some Zeppelin representation. The weird thing is that like that sentiment is explicitly in the movie. There's like a part where Matt Dillon's character is being all wistful and he's like, "Who is gonna write?" the new Misty Mountain Hop for our generation. And yeah, I mean, maybe one of the blues singers that Zeppelin stole the songs <laughs> from. Harsh. I, uh, yeah. 
I I don't know. I just there and there are legitimately a ton, a fuck ton of really good Led Zeppelin songs. Yeah. And it just baffles me that this is the one they come up with. <sighs> well, so here's the one thing I can think of. If you are the Wilson sisters and you want to do a Zeppelin song, and you both want to sing, there aren't that many Zeppelin songs that are duets, and this one does have two parts. Trade off verses. I know. I'm. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm just trying to. <laughs> trying. I'm trying to meet him halfway. <laughs> it's like. It's like going to a pet store and saying, "Oh, you both want. You can't share this. You can't share this adorable puppy. You get two turtles." <laughs> like. <laughs> it's just. I mean, yeah, it's equitable, but it's shitty. <laughs> so, so I'm guessing this song is a perennial skip. For you. <laughs> I, it, it's it's a skip, and it's like an angry skip. <laughs> it's a skip with your middle finger. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> want to take a quick yeah. break? Yeah. All right, we uh, we are back. Um, Chad, you look kind of uncomfortable over there in your crown of thorns. Yeah, so I've been busy uh, busy working on the French Quarter. <laughs> Chloe, don't. I mean, Andrew Wood did have a very high voice. Like he he was able yeah, to he did. hit some notes that I'm not able to to hit. I feel like uh, at least in the circles that I traveled in the mid '90s. Uh, Mother Love Bone was kind of a was kind of a a low key hip thing to be into. I don't think there was anything low key about it. I think that was, uh, you know, I don't know. So it's a tough thing. Where like clearly he was clearly the people in the Seattle music scene loved the guy. You know, clearly his death meant a lot to a lot of people, and like I don't want to shit on that at all. But at the same time, like. The, the weird, like, just requirement that you revere Mother Love Bone back then, like, I, I, I think that's the, the nakedest emperor situation I have ever lived through musically. Like, I, you know, I don't know. I would, like, I tried to will myself to love that album, but, like, it just, it is not for me. And if, if anyone listening likes it, I'm sincerely happy for you, but like, it ain't for me. It was it was kind of the gravity's rainbow, though. I feel like of of CDs. It might even been a double CD, I where it was, it was like everyone was into it, but nobody would listen to it apart yeah. from this song. Yeah. Where it was like, it was like, oh yeah, do you you like uh, Pearl Jam? You really like Mother Love Bone? Yeah. And they'd be like, what oh like what songs do you like? And they would always name this one. That was and that was it. There was no yeah. second. I remember there was like there was one song on there that I remember just feeling like an idiot. Like so on the Mother Love Bone album, there's a song called like Through Fade Away, I think. And the chorus was like, She's my something, she's my blah blah blah, she's my my hot magandi. And I remember like I played that song and like playing it, I'm like, I'm really cool, I'm playing Mother Love Bone on college radio. And then like I got done and I'm like, I don't think that chorus is okay. Like I, I, that ain't that ain't that ain't right. Like It's like what was the what was the band that did the Va- Valerie Plame song? Oh the Decemberists. The Decemberists, yes. I, I, I'm like, okay, we've we've just entered parody territory now. <laughs> Like, yeah. Ah, so Chloe Dancer, Crown of Thorns. I. I, I don't know. I, I just. I. Again, I'm not being fair. Uh, I, I know they have sincere fans, and I'm glad for those people that there's a band that they like. But for me, like, just no Mother Love Bone work has ever been able to live up to this myth that's that's up there. I mean, I think it. I think a lot of it is that people like Pearl Jam and yeah. Jeff Ament and Stone Gossard were in Mother Love Bone, so 
It, yeah, I know. It's weird. I just think it, it's one of those things that has just sort of taken on taken on a life of its own. Yeah. Where, like, do you remember that that CD that came out that was the Mike Watt CD? Ball hog or tug? Yes. Yeah. Where that was like for a brief second that was like the, the hipster CD to have. Yeah. And you'd have all these people lecturing you about, you know, like, what a genius Mike Watt is. And, I mean, he he is an interesting guy, but that album is objectively terrible. I So, the only the only song from that that has any presence in my head at all is the, the Eddie Vedder Against the 70s one. That song is a fucking jam. Like, I will have to check it out. That, is, that is stone cold, like... Like, I... That is a... That, that's still frequently on playlists. I think... I think for me, a lot of this ends up being, you know, I don't like to be bullied yeah. <laughs> with with my music. Yeah. And like, I don't like uh, I don't like it when people try to force things on me, which I probably well, totally do to people all the time. Uh, but, you know, uh, especially if you're not aware of that dynamic, it's tough not to do it. But so I mean that that's like with Mother Love Bone and kind of with the singles soundtrack and kind of with Grunge, like. It is weird how there's like this just river of peer pressure. And I think like one of the great things about getting older is you step out of the river. But like if you're not aware you're in it, like just so much of I don't know, so much music is just dictated to you. And like like this you know, on two levels here, like Mother Love Bone was just presented as like if you're hep you got to be into right. that. And, you know, if you're less hep, but still more hep than people just listening to the radio, you've got to be just on board with the single soundtrack. And, like, that was yeah, so 1992. I guess I don't like litmus tests. Yeah. Like, that sort of, you know, cool or not cool. And to be honest, so I, on the internet, I rail a lot more than I should against... Um, the actually pretty good radio station that we have in Minneapolis, The Current. Oh, I thought you were going to say B96. <laughs> they can do no wrong. Uh, so, like, The Current, yeah, like, The Current is a good radio station, but, like, I get really queasy at the way that they, like, I don't think this is intentional. I think this is just, like, a cultural construct. But they kind of function as this also, like, fire hose of musical peer pressure where, you know, this month they're into Locut County and like, oh, you don't like Locut County? Well, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know, and then, no, this month they like Hippocampus. And, oh, you don't like Hippocampus? Well, the fuck's wrong with you? It does. And, you know, it's, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> you know? They, they do sort of wield that sword a little bit as the cool kids in town. Yeah. Um... Would you say that they are overblown? <laughs> uh, I would say that. Is that the name of the... I think that's the Mud Honey the song. The Mud Honey, yeah. I'm, I'm not, totally just adrift from Running Order. Here. Not the Birth Ritual, which is the Soundgarden right. song. You know, we, we've already... We've covered Soundgarden. I, do you have more to say about No, I, we've actually already covered Pearl Jam, too. So that so overblown is, is good. Um, you know, like... Uh, Mud Honey is just one of those bands that I've always I've always meant to check out, um, and candidly, I've never gotten around to it. I so I, I'm gonna damn Mud Honey with faint praise here. Like I I, I like this song. Um, I think it's fine. It's like if you were plugged into a local scene, this is like a song you would get from like the above average local scene guy local scene act like I think like if this soundtrack existed for Minneapolis in the 80s and so if someone was like I'm gonna make a soundtrack that's everything that's happening in Minneapolis that's a love letter to Minneapolis in 1985 and you know and we have some Prince songs and we have some Husker Du songs and we have some replacement songs um Overblown by Mud Honey's equivalent would be like whatever Soul Asylum had on that theoretical album. Like that's, you know, like it's good. It's it's not. It, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's above average, but it's not. It's yeah, not. 
I mean, I think that's it. And I, I see looking since I'm at Keith's house and I have this book too. I see the Michael Azerod, our band could be your life, which is a great ass book. It's a very good book. Um, and there is a chapter on mud honey, um, which is a really interesting because it's. Uh, but the part about mud honey isn't the interesting part. The part is about <laughs> sub pop is the interesting part of that. Chapter. Yeah, yeah. I sub pop in general, it was a thing that I kind of came across in my you know just reading about all this that I wanted to mention and couldn't figure out how and you've given me an opening. That's right. Um, opening doors. The uh, so do you know about the thing where in the early nineties? You know, like, as Seattle started to blow up, like, right as this soundtrack came out and, like, part of this, the Times wanted to do, like, a lifestyle story about, you know, the exciting new music coming from Seattle. And so they called Sub Pop to ask them about grunge. And this woman who was just working at Sub Pop made up, like, a grunge le- lexicon <laughs> with just, like, a bunch of, like, totally bullshit this person is my hero and they just like swallowed it and printed it and it's it, it's all it's just it's awesome like because she's making up like just labels things like something about hanging on the flippity flop means something <laughs> and, oh, I wish I had written down her name because like yeah this is like this is a hero of the culture that woman should have a statue yes. uh, I mean at a minimum <laughs> Probably in elementary school. Oh. <laughs> so the, the two things circling back, the two other things I've got to say about Mud Honey, I when this album first came out, you know, through the end of high school to the beginning of college, I somehow did not understand the pronunciation of the band's name and thought it was Mud Honey. <laughs> That's even funnier. It's like the guy from Police Academy. Yeah, exactly. I think that's where I got it. Um, the, the other thing, like, you know, if I was kind of mildly shitting on them for, you know, just being a little bit above average, uh, the, the, the the title of the song and, like, all of the vibe within it is overblown. So, like, I think they know. And, and I love them for that. Like, that's legit. I mean, I, I would, if, if my band was named Mud Honey, all the songs would also be named Mud Honey. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I, I guess too, like, being an above average band in the local scene is a pretty good goal. Like, that's, that's not, uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, you know, it only becomes sneeze worthy if it's. You know, I don't know if it's part of this like thing that's like this is a generational statement, and you know, no, it's just a bunch of music, and some of it's okay, and some of it's not. Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that that brings us to uh, the second Westerberg track, which I think is a jam, like. The production's not great, but so I, there's this weird thing where the two Westerberg tracks are kind of the same song. They're both just like the same F G C riff, or I think it's F C G. Um, you know, the timing's a little different, but it, it's the same thing. But it comes together a little better with "Waiting for Somebody." I mean, for me, I guess "Waiting for Somebody" is sort of like. That's just sort of the vibe that a lot of the good replacement songs have. It's sort yeah. Of the, like, it just sort of fits in that wheelhouse of, you know, like, Here Comes a Regular yeah. or, uh, you know, Skyway or something like that. They just have that, like, they have that sort of... Like, dissatisfied yeah, yearning. Or, I, I guess, unsatisfied would probably be the best example. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, they kind of... It, it just hits that note of like kind of what the replacements songs are about yeah yeah uh, I mean dyslexic heart does too but it's just it's a little more nuanced yeah. than well and it, dyslexic heart is a little precious where it's got all the like wordplay of like my heart could use some glasses and waiting for somebody is more like yeah it's a little more straightforward yeah uh, oops it's funny to me how so, like, if you are speaking 
you know, even sloppy Minnesota accented standard English, you want to pronounce it waiting for somebody. But like in Westerberg delivery, it sounds wrong to do it any other way than waiting for somebody. Yeah. And I don't know. The man, the man takes the language to strange new places. Um, so this is an aside, but uh, they, for those listeners who are not from Minneapolis, they had a replacements reunion concert. They had the, the concert was at Midway Stadium, where the Saints used to play, and uh, I I'm standing there, complete stranger, next to me, taps me on the arm and says, "I'm gonna smoke this joint when they play Skyway." <laughs> Great. Sounds fantastic. And I look over the next song and he's lighting the joint. And I'm like, do I tell him that this is not Skyward? <laughs> like, am I this guy? Like, what what is my responsibility here? How committed I am I to this to this guy? So how did you play it? I just let him roll with it. You know, like the man thinks it's Skyway. Ah, oh, you know, okay. <laughs> that reminds me of Two things. One of them is like I have never felt more like a fucking dust-covered skeleton than the time fucking ten years ago, which is.